My name is Marnus Westrotter, and the topic of my PhD thesis is the LC error and capacitive shunt shunt feedback LNA modeling for wideband HPT receivers. My supervisor is Professor Sarab Sina. I will start the presentation by discussing the hypothesis and research questions, and also giving a background on Lono's amplifiers. From there, I will start a chronological discussion of the research methodology, including a look at the other LNA topologies that were investigated, the derivation of the mathematical model of the proposed configuration, and also present the simulated and measured results. In this thesis, it was hypothesized that if a fourth-order LC ladder filter realizes arbitrary wide input patching, and the shunt shunt capacitive feedback common emitter amplifier can be modeled as an equivalent series RC circuit, then a combination of these two circuits can be used as a wideband LNA, overcoming selected shortcomings of current LNAs in literature. This was formulated as the research question, how can it be shown that this configuration realizes wideband LNAs operation and overcomes selected shortcomings? This question was broken down into four sub-questions, the first being, how can a mathematical model be derived to prove that the above is attained? The second to fourth questions relate to the outer ladder and inductively emitted degenerated LNA configuration, and they are how can the lower corner frequency pole be removed, which is inherent in that topology? How can the inductor count be reduced? And finally, how can the collector current and lower corner frequency values be decoupled? The research methodology that was used in this work is shown in the block diagram on the right of the slide. This slide shows the justification for the research, or more specifically, where this work fits into the existing body of knowledge. It can be seen from the results that the proposed configuration achieves a very low noise figure, even though it was, the design was done for a bandwidth much larger than those of the other LNAs, that are shown in this table. Typical gain and input return loss results were also obtained, and the power consumption of the LNA falls well within the average range of the LNAs in literature. The only area in which this topology does not excel is, is the linearity of the LNA, although it should be noted that the measured um, 1 dB compression point was minus 22 dBm, and thus the IP3 should theoretically be around minus 12 dBm, which is at least comparable to the other LNA configurations. This does however point out that this configuration is particularly suited for applications where a very low noise figure over a very wide bandwidth is required, but the linearity of the amplifier is only a secondary concern. It also indicates an important area for future research. In any wireless receiver, the first subsystem is usually a low noise amplifier. This amplifier is used to amplify the small signals received from the antenna while adding as little as possible noise, so these signals can be processed by the subsequent systems of the receiver. The hexagon in the bottom right of this slide shows the important performance characteristics for LNAs. The gain and the noise figure of the LNA are the two obvious ones but the frequency band and also the input return loss attained over this band of operation are also important. The linearity comes into play when larger signals are amplified and there is intermodulation at different frequencies. And finally, the power consumption is always a constraint in any design and especially so in battery powered portable devices. This slide shows some of the existing LNA configurations that were investigated and which led to the proposal of the new LNA topology and also the derivation of its mathematical model. The LNA configurations at the top of this slide might be seen as the more traditional topologies, but they suffer from relatively high noise figure due to the use of resistors and also the unity current gain of the LNA in the common base configuration. The inductive emitter degeneration technique in the bottom left corner, however, is probably the most frequently used narrowband topology today. This is a result of the fact that it is theoretically possible to achieve simultaneous conjugate and optimal noise match using this configuration, as I will show later. In the middle bottom row, 
We also find the capacitive shunt shunt feedback topology, which was introduced relatively recently as an alternative to the emitted generation technique. This topology also realizes an equivalent series LLC circuit, but with the use of just one inductor, which makes it much less area consuming in a final implementation. These two configurations are, however, both narrowband and therefore not well suited in wideband applications. The LNA on the far right, however, is a wideband configuration and uses a fourth order LC ladder filter together with the inductive emitted generated configuration to realize wideband low noise operation. I will however show a few slides from now that it suffers from some significant shortcomings. This slide shows how impedance matching is done in the super high frequency range using the inductively emitted degenerated LNA. First, I'll draw your attention to the equation at the top right. We can see that the high frequency current gain can be approximated by this very simple equation when the transistor is operated close to its unity gain frequency. When the current gain is substituted into the equation for the input impedance, we then find that the inductive emitted degenerated LNA produce an equivalent series RLC circuit. In this equivalent circuit, the resistive part can then be selected equal to the characteristic impedance of the system, usually 50 ohm, and then the reactive components can be tuned to the desired operating frequency. The result of this is shown in the graph in the bottom right corner of this slide. The blue line indicates that a conjugate match is obtained at 5 gigahertz, as because we can see that the input return loss is less than minus 10 dB at that frequency. The gain is also maximized at 5 gigahertz at around about 16 dB. Finally, we also see that the noise figure is a minimum at the desired operating frequency. And the noise figure is minimized by scaling the emitter length of the transistor such that the optimal noise impedance or resistance become equal to the characteristic impedance as well and therefore we obtain the simultaneous conjugate and optimal noise match, as I mentioned earlier. This slide shows the alternative configuration, which is the capacitive shunt shunt feedback topology. And we can see that from simple small signal analysis, we can obtain the equation in the middle of the slide for the Miller impedance of the circuit. If we then use some impedance transforms, the equations at the bottom of the slide characterize the equivalent series or C circuit that results from this topology. If this is then coupled by a series inductor at the base, we're again left with a series RLC circuit that can be tuned to the desired operating frequency, as I've shown before. The third configuration that I look at is the LC ladder and inductive emitted degeneration technique, which, as I've mentioned, is a wideband configuration. This wideband matching results from the use of an equivalent fourth order LCL tank circuit. And using the design equations in the bottom left of this slide, it's been shown that it's theoretically possible to obtain an arbitrary wide matched input bandwidth using this circuit. Then, since the circuit uses a series RLC circuit, one can, of course, substitute that part of the circuit with the inductive emitted degenerated topology and thereby obtain a complete wideband LNA. However, this slide shows the shortcomings of this configuration. First of all, it requires four inductors to obtain the desired frequency response. Secondly, there is a, inherently a pole introduced at the lower corner frequency when using this topology. This can be seen from the transfer function from the source voltage to the base emitter junction, shown in the bottom left of this slide. If the input current is assumed to be the voltage divided by twice the characteristic impedance, thus implying a conjugate match over the entire operating band, and this is multiplied by the impedance seen at the base emitter junction, which is C2, then the transfer function at the bottom clearly shows that there is always a pole present when using this configuration. And it is in fact due to this pole that the load inductance is necessary to equalize the frequency response of this LNA. The third disadvantage is the tight coupling between the lower corner frequency and the required collector current value. If we substitute the equation for, the, for omega t 
along with the equation for C2. Then we find the design equation for the collective current in the bottom right of this slide. And we can see that for a given design specification, all the variables in that equation would be constants. It is in an attempt to overcome these shortcomings that the LC ladder and capacitive shunt shunt feedback conf configuration was then proposed, as shown in this slide. The rest of the presentation will also center around the mathematical modeling of this configuration, and I will point out how it overcomes the shortcomings that I've mentioned in the previous slide. If we look at the input matching modeling, the equation at the bottom left can be derived to characterize the input impedance from where the input return loss can be obtained. But I want to draw your attention to the equation at the bottom right, which again shows the transfer function of the source voltage to the base emitter junction. Again, we assume that the input current results from a conjugate match, but this time when we multiply with the impedance seen at the base emitter junction, it is not only the capacitance C2, but also the resistive part of the RLC circuit. If we then simplify the equation, we obtain the transfer function at the very bottom right of the slide, which shows that although the pole is still present, there is now also a zero introduced at the lower corner frequency. And this zero serves to cancel the pole, thus resulting in a flat frequency response over the entire band of interest. We can also see in the top right from the circuit that this configuration requires only three inductors as opposed to four in the emittedly generated case. And in fact, the, the inductor L3, which is the load inductor of the second stage, is only required because the transistors are operated close to their unity gain frequency. And therefore, the inductor was necessary to provide peaking where the gain roll-off starts to take effect. But if the transistors were operated at lower frequencies, the inductor count could be reduced to as little as two inductors. The gain derivation was done in three parts, the first being that of the input matching network, which is simply the transfer function from the source voltage to the base emitter junction. The source voltage was moved in series with the, junction, with the other impedances by using a Norton and then Thevenin transform, and then the transfer function was derived as a simple voltage divider. The first stage gain consists of the transconductance gain of the transistor, reduced by the large feedback capacitance, and this is multiplied by the load impedance of the first amplifier stage. The second stage gain, of course, is simply the transconductance gain multiplied with the impedance of the load inductor. From the equations presented thus far, we can now derive some design equations for LNAs using this topology. The design would start with the selection of the reactive components, which is done using the simple design equations at the top of the slide, using the specified upper and lower corner frequencies. From the equation for C2, we can then derive a design equation for CF, provided we select again for the first amplifier stage. From the equation for RS, we can obtain a design equation for IC, and then we can obtain a design equation for the load resistance using the selected voltage gain. It should be noted that the part in brackets in the IC equation would in most cases tend to 1. However, it is possible to increase the collector current to improve the noise performance, as I will show momentarily. And in such cases, it might be necessary to increase the load capacitance in order to maintain proper matching. And therefore, this, the bracket should be maintained in this equation. It's also noted that a method for electronic design automation using these design equations has been proposed. This slide shows a comparison between the results generated with the mathematical model and those resulting from simulations using the hit kits provided by IBM for the 8HP by CMOS process. And as you can see in this plot, the mathematical results and simulations coincide very nicely, showing the accuracy of the mathematical model. We now come to the derivation of the noise figure. This circuit shows the first stage of the LNA, and it's the equivalent circuit including all the relevant noise sources. 
However, using this circuit to derive a noise figure equation would be unnecessarily complex, and therefore certain transformations were applied in order to simplify the derivation. In this slide, we can see that the source resistance voltage noise and also the noise from inductor L1 have been moved in series with the other impedances and input of the amplifier through a Norton and then Thevenin transformation. The equations for this are shown in the bottom left of this slide. The transistor has also been replaced by an equivalent noise-free voltage amplifier and the equivalent common emitter voltage and current noise sources. The current noise source, however, has been increased by the feedback capacitance, which is taken into account with the additional term shown in the bottom right hand of this slide. After these transformations, the contribution of each noise source over the base emitter junction was substituted into the equation for the noise factor shown at the top of this slide. After collecting terms, the definition of the noise factor of this configuration was then determined to be the equation shown at the bottom. And while this equation might look daunting at first glance, it's interesting to note that each noise source occurs only once in the equation and then as a separate term with a unique coefficient. This is convenient because it means that each noise contribution can be plotted separately and thereby the dominant noise contributor in this circuit can be identified. This graph shows such a plot and it can be seen that the common emitter voltage noise source is by far the dominant noise contribution in the LNA. And this allowed a very focused noise optimization technique to be deduced. If we look at the slightly rewritten noise factor equation at the top of this slide and we inspect the impedances found in the coefficients of the terms, we can see that in order to optimize for minimum noise figure, it is required to reduce the value of L2, increase L1, and also reduce C1. And then because the feedback capacitance plays such a large part in increasing the common emitter voltage noise, it's also very important to reduce the value of C2. Also, because the common emitter voltage noise is the dominant contributor, we can minimize that term in itself, which entails increasing the collector current as far as possible to increase the transconductance gain and also minimizing the base series resistance by using the largest available emitter length for the transistor. This graph shows a plot of the individual noise contributions after these optimizations were done, and we can see that there has been significant improvement of the common emitter voltage noise contribution in comparison to the source resistance noise and this will serve to significantly reduce the noise figure of the LMA. The other noise sources at the bottom has also been slightly reduced. The effect of these optimizations can also be more clearly seen in this graph showing the noise figure results. And here the red plot shows the results calculated from the mathematical model, again showing that it coincides very well with simulated results. The magenta line is then the simulated noise figure after it has been optimized compared to the green plot, which is the original noise figure. And one can see that the optimization resulted in as much as a 1 dB improvement in some areas, and that there has been at least 0.4 dB improvement over the entire frequency band of operation. We can then look at how the gain of the LNA can be increased. And the equation shown in this slide is the combined gain equation of the three separate equations that I've shown earlier. And if we then look at the reactive terms, once again, we see that increasing the gain requires reducing L2, increasing L1, decreasing C1, and decreasing Cf. But you will also recall that these were the same requirements for minimizing the noise figure. And this means that the typical noise figure gain trade-off found in most LNA configurations is not applicable to the proposed topology at all, which is, of course, very beneficial. This is further evident when looking at increasing the first stage voltage gain, which would mean a smaller CF can be used, since there is more Miller multiplication, and increased first stage gain will also reduce the second stage noise further. And then, of course, because we increase the transconductance gain of the first stage, the common emitter voltage noise is also reduced. 
Furthermore, an approximation for the linearity of the LNA was also derived. This was done with the equation shown on this slide for the IIP3 of the LNA. The noise figure versus bandwidth trade-off was also characterized. This was done by using the noise factor equation, simplified to include only the dominant common emitter voltage noise term, and then substituting the equation for CF into the noise factor equation. If we then solve for the lower corner frequency, and we substitute the values of F max and the upper corner frequency, we obtain a mathematical definition for the relationship that exists between the maximum noise factor and the bandwidth of the LNA. Finally, because the lower corner frequency is determined by the feedback capacitance and the minimum feedback capacitance is the intrinsic basic collector parasitic capacitance, this places a maximum value on the lower corner frequency that can be designed for. This slide shows the layout of the LNA that was submitted for fabrication in the IBM 7WL process for operation over the 3 to 14 GHz frequency band. It can be seen from the layout on the left hand side that the inductors indeed make up the, the largest part of the chip real estate that was used for the LNA and this emphasizes the need to reduce the inductor count as far as possible. In the bottom right I show a die photo of the fabricated LNA. This slide also shows a die photo of the entire multi-project chip with the area where the LNAs have been placed highlighted by the black rectangle. Unfortunately, on wafer measurement equipment is not available, and therefore the dies had to be packaged in QFN packages and mounted on a PCB for measurement. This, however, introduced significant parasitics into the measurement path, which caused signal degradation and also introduced much uncertainty into the measured results. However, the results that I will present in a moment still shows that the LNA has good promise for use in practical applications. This slide shows the calibration part that was included on the chip, which was used to identify the effect of the parasitics introduced into the measurement part. And one can see that there is significant attenuation above 3 GHz, and also that there is quite a number of resonant peaks that have been introduced into the circuit. It was therefore expected that the measured gain would show similar degradation and also resonance peaks as found in the calibration path. And therefore, in an attempt to de-embed the measured results, the calibration path was subtracted from the original measured results, as shown here in the plot on the left, where the red graph shows the de-embedded gain measurement. However, because the resonant peaks on two separate measurement paths would not cancel each other exactly, it was warranted to use a moving average smoothing function in order to obtain a better idea of what this measurement might have looked like had on wafer measurements been practical. And this is shown in the red plot in the graph on the right. The same can be said for the input return loss that was measured. This plot shows the original measured results in blue, and then after the moving average smoothing function was applied, the plot in red was obtained. This slide compares the measured smoothed results to the predicted results from the circuit simulations, and one can see that the input return loss measured results actually track the simulated results very well. In the case of the gain, although the shape of the graph is practically similar to that of the simulated results, the gain is 9 dB less than what was predicted. And this is probably to a large extent due to the unwanted parasitics and losses introduced into the measurement path. The 1 dB compression point of the LNA was measured at minus 22 dBm. In conclusion, I will say that the mathematical model shows that wideband matching and very low noise operation can be realized using the accelerator and capacitive shunt shunt feedback LNA topology. The pole at the lower corner frequency 
present in the inductively emitted degenerate version of the circuit is cancelled by a zero in this case. Since there is no emitter inductor, only two to three inductors are required to realize this operation. And more freedom is available in selection of the collector current because the matching is realized using the Miller capacitance, which can be set independently of the collector current. This work produced five peer-reviewed conference papers, as shown on this slide, and also three journal publications in accredited peer-reviewed journals, along with a fourth article which has been resubmitted after addressing reviewer comments. And finally, I will acknowledge all the organizations that have contributed to this research. Thank you.